think I'm beginning to finally feel okay. I met someone named Jesus just, well, just the other day. It is well, it is well with my soul. Thank you, John. We also have a very special guest. I think people out in Whiting must like me because we have a dear friend, Barbara, who's traveled all the way from Whiting today to join us. And Barbara, it's wonderful to have you here. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. We've had many friends from Whiting over the years. Yes, we have. Let me open us in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we again, Lord, are gathered in the wonderful name of Jesus, name above all names, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And Father, we're excited to once again to go into your word, to study the book of Revelation, to declare your truth. And Lord, I know all these people around this table love you and that's why father we bless your name and that's why it is well with our souls because of the lord jesus christ and the victory won at calvary for surely christ crucified he died for our sins once for all and it's forever finished Amen. and in this we rejoice and so lord we look forward to these days ahead of studying together Open our eyes to the truth, for surely the truth will set us free. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the one way I wanted to start, and I am recording this series as well, because we have a number of shut-ins in these days that also want to be able to watch the Bible study. But I wanted to show you, I don't know if you'll be able to see this picture, but I'm going to hold it up anyway because it's going to be on the camera. And this is a picture taken in our daughter Addie's living room in, in Utah. And there's a television set. I don't know if you can see that at the top. And I, I believe that's me <laughs> on the television. But see why I love this picture. And this is a little harder to see. But down here in this corner, there's a little fellow named Ewan, our grandson who's watching his pappy on television. And so I've decided to keep him in my will. <laughs> so Ewan, welcome to our Bible study. Because I'll tell you, I'm, he will watch this at some point, I'm, I can assure you. Well, now I want to first get right into the Word, and if you'll get your Bibles open to the book of Revelation. I ask you not to read ahead in your notes because you'll steal my thunder. Some of you are trying to get ahead of me. Suzanne, nice suntan. You and Dewey, you've been out on a boat? Just down at the ocean, the both of you? You're looking great. Retirement's doing well by the both of you. I should retire sometime. But then you would all complain, so. Well, I hope you have a pen if you want to take your own notes. Because one of the things that's important to me, and this is going to be a teaching series, and all of us might be in a rather different place in terms of what we know or what we don't know about the book of Revelation. And so before we even get into the notes, I wanted to do a quick flyover of the book so that you hopefully will memorize over time how it flows because it's, it's actually not too hard, really isn't. 
Years ago, I was taught actually by my sister who was in Bible college, uh, the book of Revelation, and she brought us into chapter 1 at verse 19. And what commentators have realized throughout the years is that verse 19 in chapter 1 is the key that unlocks the outline structure for the entire book of Revelation. Therefore, and I'm using the New American Standard Bible, therefore write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. You can see that there's a three-part division here, isn't there? And you'll notice that the first, the things which you have seen, refers to what? The past. The things which are would then therefore refer to a present. And then we have the things which will take place after these things, which is the future. And this is all being written from the standpoint of the Apostle John. Now, what are the things which John has seen? It's everything that comes before verse 19. That's what he has already seen, which eventually we'll examine here in chapter 1. We'll get to that probably next time. But in chapter 1, the things that he has seen Primarily, there's one major thing that he has seen, and that is he receives a vision of Christ. A vision of Christ. You can write that down. Chapter 1, a vision of Christ. These are the things that John has seen. And maybe an easy way to remember this is to think how the book of Revelation and I will jump all over you if I catch you saying revelations because there's no S on the end of it because it's a revelation of one person, of King Jesus. And so when I say the book starts off with a vision of Christ, it kind of makes sense because it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we receive this great vision of our Lord which we will look at, like I said, in a future week. It's a glorious vision because it's also a vision of our Lord glorified, quite different in how he would be today. Now, in chapters 2 and 3, and we can just peruse these, if you look at the beginning of chapter 2, it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. You see that? In the same chapter, looking down, to verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Flip over a page, at least I have to. To verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Looking a little bit further down to verse 18, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira. And then if we go over to chapter 3, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis. Then looking a little bit further, verse 7, chapter 3, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. And then finally, down in verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Add those all together, how many? Seven. Seven churches. And I know, because I've told on this with many and most of you in the past, this is in the region that was known as Asia Minor. Uh, that's not in the Orient. That's where modern-day Turkey is today. And it would, these seven locations were primarily in that southwestern region of Asia Minor, or today, the western part of modern-day Turkey. Uh, these were significant churches 
that John, who had ministered to them, Paul to many of these churches, as well as others like Timothy, Titus, etc. But these are seven selected churches. So in chapter one, the things which he had seen was the vision of Christ. Now the things which are who he is addressing in these seven letters are to these seven churches, the letters to the seven churches. Did you catch that? The things which are refers to chapters two and three to the seven churches that were existing in John's day who the Lord had a very special message for each one of these churches. So then, we only have one more major division, correct? The things which shall take place after these things at some place in the future, which we're going to have to talk about and we'll, we will touch on today. Very simply, and this is the way it has helped me through the years to, to remember this, is that from chapter 4 all the way to the last chapter, 22, are the things which were lying out in the future. And if you think about it from almost like a story sort of perspective, what happens is that in chapters 4 and 5, you write this down, in chapters 4 and 5, John has a vision of heaven. He's caught up into heaven. He has a vision of heaven in these two chapters, and there's many things he's going to tell us that take place in, in these um, two chapters. Then, from chapter 6 through chapter 18, we have the seven seals, this is followed by the seven trumpets, followed by the seven bowls. So all you have to remember are seals, and if you can picture this in your mind of what's going to happen is the Lord Jesus is going to be breaking these seven seals open, and then it's followed by the blast of seven trumpets. In each trumpet, there's a different judgment that's taking place. And then finally, with the last trumpet, there are seven bowls. And the bowls picture the idea of, think about this, of God pouring out his wrath. Right? You catch that image in your mind? So, in other words, from chapter 6 through 18, you think about a scroll that has seven seals. You think about seven trumpets that are going to blast. And you think finally about the seven bowls of God's wrath. And maybe that'll help you. So, in other words, it begins with a vision of Christ. Then there are seven letters addressed to seven churches. And then we're called up into heaven in chapters 4 and 5. And then from chapters 6 through 18, the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. Now, what culminates all of this is chapter 19, where in chapter 19, we have Christ coming to the earth. This is very significant, and I'm adding these last words. This isn't just Christ coming. This is Christ coming now to the earth. And if I wanted to complete the sentence even further, I would say Christ coming to the earth to establish his kingdom on the earth. But this is Christ, and, and actually when you look at chapter 19, in chapter 19, he comes with the armies of heaven to defeat all of his enemies. And so, you have these seals, you have these trumpets, you have these bowls of God's wrath, and it all comes together with Christ coming in chapter 19. In ch chapter 20, then, you have what's referred to as the millennium. Now, everyone should learn how to spell millennium. Do you know how to? It has two L's and it has two N's. And that'll help you learn how to spell millennium. It refers to a thousand, a thousand year rule. 
when he comes to establish his kingdom on earth, then there'll be this period known as the millennium, thousand years. Again, we're going to talk about that too in a variety of viewpoints when we get there. But at the conclusion, what else happens is significant in chapter 20 is the great white throne judgment. That's a big day because that's when if someone's name is not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, along with Satan and the demons who have already been cast into the lake of fire, that's where, unfortunately, people who have not believed in the Lord will go. Very significant chapter. So then, we only have two chapters left, correct? Chapters 21 and 22. And it's a shame that people don't read the book of Revelation because those last two chapters are some of the most glorious, encouraging, most blessed chapters because it tells us about the new heavens and the new earth in which Christ will reign and rule for all eternity. And the best part is it tells us no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So can you see how it flows? Christ's vision, a letter to seven churches, we're called up into heaven. Then we have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, all brought together with Christ coming back to the earth, chapter 19, the millennial reign in chapter 20, followed by the great white throne judgment, and then the new heavens and the new earth. And we could also add the new Jerusalem as well, which comes down from heaven. It's rather interesting in chapters 21 and 22. Now, you know, if you, if you, if you have that, if you have that, just think about that. It really, it really just helps you to get such a, an immediate grasp on the book of Revelation. And as I would say is, for example, someone said to me, if I heard a pastor say, turn to chapter 5 in the book of Revelation, I would know we're in the vision section of him being called up into heaven. I would know if we were somewhere between chapter 6 through 18, that we're somewhere in the seals, trumpets, or bowls. I would know if I'm in chapter 1, it begins with a vision of Christ. Or that chapters 2 and 3 are the seven letters to the seven churches. And it, it, it helps you to put everything together. Now think about this too. There is also a, a logical sense to what also takes place in the book. The book doesn't jump around, it marches forward. It begins with Christ, it begins with those seven churches, but then takes us out into the future and says, yes, but there's also something else that's going on. And John gets called up into heaven, and this is what he sees, and this is what he hears. And all these seals opening, and trumpets blasting, and all the things that are happening, and then the, the bowls of wrath, followed by here comes Christ with his bride and the armies of heaven, back to the earth to establish his kingdom. And then, at the end, establishing a new heavens and a new earth. And that's where we'll be if we know Jesus. So it's a really cool thing. And, and it's another reason why Christians should have a hand, should have a handle. Now look, there are, there are places that we can, and we'll see sometimes a variety of viewpoints and people have maybe different understanding about things. Um, but there's enough here for us that we can understand uh, one of the reasons why we should go into it. Now, the notes I've prepared for you are actually my own notes. I don't intend to just always just read them to you, but I will read parts and aspects of them because I felt, well, I'll just, I'll just give you everything. I'll just give you the whole meal. And that's nice of me. When, when Brother Ash teaches, he makes people fill in the blank. <laughs> so, we're going to go right over to the introduction on page two. And of course, again, you can make your little side notes. I will say on the front side, front page below my name, any errors are my own. 
I'm not referring to the scripture. I'm referring to any mistakes I might make, grammar, or who knows, maybe I've got the wrong idea about something. But one of the things I definitely need to do today, now we've just been in the Word of God, um, because I, I, as often as we will, we will be in the Word of God. But there's also this part that I have to lay some background and, and I'd spent a lot of time on this because it's really, really important. And as I get into this, I'll explain why it's so important. You see, it wasn't until my adult years on page two, do I ever remember hearing someone use the phrase, and it was actually in academia, the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. I said, well, that's, that's a rather lofty thing to say. It never struck me that way. Of course, it really comes just from the Greek word apocalypsis for the word in English, revelation. So, but they create a category out of it, which is what we mean by the word genre, a category of if, what kinds of genre do we have? We have poetry, we have fiction, we have history books. There's, in other words, there's all kinds of different flavors. So the question really is, and this is an important question, so what is the book of Revelation? If you, if just the book of Revelation was published and it was placed in a bookstore, where would it be placed in the Barnes and Nobles? In, in what section? It depends. It depends on who's thinking about it because someone might say it's, it's, it's fiction. It's fiction. Um, what is fiction? Fiction is a make-believe story. When uh, I was a boy, and I would go with mom to the A&P. Why? Because there was a big pickle barrel there. And mom always let me pick out a pickle. And I could get the crunch on that pickle before she even paid for it. Anybody remember those pickle barrels? <laughs> I love those pickles, still do. But something else, I love to read. And I don't know if they publish these today. I don't know if they're worthy of reading today. But at least back in my time, they were safe to read. And that was the Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. It had all these mysteries in it. I loved every time a new edition came out. I was sure to get that. And Mom would buy it for me. I, I enjoy science fiction, don't I, Craig? Yes. And what do I especially enjoy? End times. End times disaster movies, yes. yeah. right? I know they don't like me down here at the shore saying it, but tidal waves and <laughs> all of the, oh, asteroids, get me going on that. I will, I'll be mentioning that again. Mark your calendars, April 13th, 2029. <laughs> it is coming and that's according to NASA so I know I have people I'm, I'm going to be talking with a friend of mine soon I hope again making my appeal for why they also have a space force uh, what's, what's actually there is something coming our way but that being said I enjoy fiction but some people you know in some bookstores they might say well th this book of Revelation belongs in the fiction section. Of course, others might look at a book and say, well, is this a parable? Now, a parable can be based on actual or made up events. Uh, but why Jesus gave many parables, didn't he? Jesus told many stories, but when he told the stories, there was always a, a moral. There, were, there was always a lesson, right? that he was trying to tell. The prodigal son, classic story, isn't it? Did the cla was there a real, actual prodigal son? Well, one thing I can say is over the course of history, there's probably been thousands, if not millions, of prodigal sons. But what does the story communicate? Rebellion, repentance, forgiveness, restoration. Why do I mention this? Because an allegory is 
what is called an extended parable. A parable is like a short, and as you know, if you read one of Jesus' parables, they can even be four or five verses long. But an allegory is an extended parable. It's, it's, a, it's a lengthy one that's drawn up from make-believe or actual events. It's like what we might call creative writing. It weaves themes together over pages and, and you begin at page three. What's the theme? Where's the author? What's he trying to say? An, an allegorical book might be a kind of book where, where you just say, I love this book. It was so entertaining and has a great feel-good factor to it. As my Linda and I would say, if we're ever to go to the movies, we are terribly disappointed if we don't leave with a good feel-good factor. After all, we paid to go see it. We want to be made to feel good, not miserable. <laughs> so, coming to Revelation, some folk in the academic world look at Revelation in those categories I just talked about. There are people in the widest Christian circle, and that's really pushing it, who would say that Revelation is nothing more than good fiction. Or some would say, well, and this is a very popular view. Well, it's really more like an allegory. It's not that this really is going to happen or happened. But John's trying to, or was it John? It might have been somebody else. Probably was, they would say. Well, Revelation does create a great picture of Jesus and, and victory and wars and and of course the ending is wonderful and so a lot of folk would go that route they would go that route and say well that the book of revelation i mentioned it here is a it's a grand allegory and but we're not to take these things and and to believe that well now this isn't really going to happen is it and of course within the book of revelation and by the way, everything I just said, just to be clear, now most of you know this, that this is not my viewpoint. I just, Barbara, this is not my viewpoint. But I want, pe I want you all to know this because I will tell you in, in many of the mainline Protestant churches, most of their pastors are being trained to believe it is nothing more than an allegory. Just like they would go back to the book of Genesis and say, the whole creation, that's an allegory. The, the, the flood, that was an allegory. They would come to the book of Jonah. There was never a guy who got swallowed by a fish. It's an allegory, you see? Uh, and so that's a very uh, wide and popular view among mainline. And, and also you would, you would find it too in, in Catholicism, that the this, this same approach as well, this, this wider view. And, and so they would probably think you're the one who's insane for believing it, if you do. Now, let's, let's grant this. There's a lot of symbolism, again, page three, in the book of Revelation. Yes, there is, there's lots of symbolism. Let's look, look back again at chapter one. Chapter one. Revelation chapter one. In verse 12, John records, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His hair, excuse me, his head, and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. How, how white is that? White. Really white. Right? White, white. And his eyes 
were like, and like is a, a word that tells us what, that we're talking about what? Symbolic language. What I'd like to call is really descriptive language. Descriptive. But his eyes were like a flame of fire. What does that make you think of? Piercing. Yes. Piercing. His feet were like burnished bronze. When it's been made to glow in a furnace. Fiery. And his voice like what? The sound of many waters. So what would that sound like? You've been to Niagara Falls? How loud does it get? Pretty loud, right? And that's what he's saying here. In his right hand, he held, what? He held seven stars? How's that possible? And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. There's a lot of symbolic language there, isn't there? There's a lot to try to figure out. That's true. Uh, some people, when they come to Revelation, again, back in your notes, look to something that's called numerology. That means the study of numbers. My dear friend who's now with the Lord, Ed Chatterton, loved numbers. And he would always bring it up to me and ask me what I thought. Now, the idea of studying numbers is like trying to find a code language. I remember years ago reading somewhere, I don't know what book it was in or who had published it, about someone found somewhere in the Old Testament looking at the Hebrew words and, and, and uh, writing out numbers according to each letter of the Hebrew and how it predicted the day that John F. Kennedy would be shot dead. So, very, so that could be an example. Uh, we read, we are going to read in the book of Revelation, six, 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 right? What was the number before that? <laughs> six, six, five. And, and we're, we're told that in this case though, but in this case though, we're told that that number correlates somehow with someone's name. But then we're never told the name. And it depends on which political side of the aisle you're on. Because with each one that gets elected, somehow someone figures out, it must be him. And, and that's been going on for years. Or it must be that guy over in France. Because it fits, fits uh, was it Macaron? Is that is the name of the guy? I want to say Macaroni, but. <laughs> or, or someone else. Um, somebody had a name Hussein. Um, they put him there, there too. They also put George Bush, they put Ronald Reagan there. They put, well, you get the point, don't you? Now, here's the thing. There's no question that the number seven sure seems to be a favorite number in the book of Revelation because it does show up an, an uncanny number of times. And so how are we to understand that? But here's the thing, here's the thing. Now I just read to you this vision of Christ and some people would say, now this, this, this is all so mysterious, it's so confusing. Uh, I, why should I bother to read and study this book? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's out there. It's hard to understand. I remember hearing an Episcopalian priest, because I did, joke about it, because one Sunday in their lectionary, the lectionary had selected a passage from Revelation. I think it took him by a little bit of surprise when he came to it, because his comment was, how can anyone really understand it? And then he laughed. He laughed. He said, you know, who, who knows, right? But I thought that was rather not where I'm at. But have you ever considered 
in Revelation 1 3. Revelation 1 3 tells us something. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, I just start with the first, very first word. That first word says blessed, happy. Do you know that in, in, when you read all the different books in the Bible, this is a very special book. This book is an invitation is saying, why are you staying away from this? This book promises a blessing. This book says you're going to be blessed if you read or hear the things that are recorded in this book. And I think that's every reason to come, Lord willing, on Wednesdays. Because you're going to receive a blessing. It's, it's going to be a blessing. Because the book of Revelation really does declare that our sovereign God has the future in the palm of his hand. Amen. And, you know, the things that you and I have to live through in the days in which we're living, and someday he's going to make it all new. Amen. Well, now, the bottom of page three, God-inspired prophetic report. What I aim to do is to categorize the book of Revelation and submit that it rises above the crest of human authorship to God-inspired writing. And that's why the early church, interestingly enough, the early church accepted the book of Revelation into what became the biblical canon, the Bible itself. Um, the book of Revelation is obviously prophetic. Look at these references with me in, in your Bibles. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this what? Prophecy. Prophecy. Turn on the way back to chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 10. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? Of prophecy. Go back to chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 7. And behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Now, what are we just seeing? We just saw that in chapter 1, on the front end, we're told we're going to be blessed. And now what are we being told in the last chapter? We're going to be blessed. We're going to be blessed. We're going to be blessed. And if you look at verse 10, and he said to me, don't seal up the words of what? The prophecy of this book, for the time's near. That's, that's a way of saying, whatever you do, Christian, don't close up the pages of this book and stick it on a shelf so it can collect dust. Verse 18, I testify, chapter 22 again, to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. Verse 19, and if anyone takes away from the words of the, prof of this, of, of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and the holy city which are written in this book. That's serious. That's very serious. It's the Lord God declaring that, you know, this is God saying, this is my word. This is my prophetic word. Believe it. I know in the past some of the ladies have studied the book of Daniel. What does modern scholarship do with the book of Daniel? They can't stand the fact that Daniel prophesied the future. And he did so with such utter accuracy when he prophesied of the Babylonian, then Medes and Persians, 
and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. They couldn't stand the fact that he could be so accurate. And so what did they do? They changed the date of the book. They pushed its timeline way forward. That way it would no longer have to be prophecy. And of course, they got rid of Daniel in the process and said, well, it was just somebody else that was posing to be Daniel at that time. And the same thing has happened today. That there, and it's interesting because when I announced I was going to do a deep dive in the book of Revelation, you always get two responses. Yeehaw! And good grief. <laughs> I remember years ago, I remember one person, Linda knows this as well, we don't ask us, but there was one person who purposely stayed away when I was preaching from the book of Revelation. It belongs in the Word of God. And, you know, it brings an important message. Now, I, you know, I find myself anywhere I'm in the Bible, it's always fresh to me. What you have today, these notes that I'm going to be bringing, I'm going to tell you right now, they're not finished. I'm in the process myself, just like when I prepare a Sunday sermon. I'm doing this work every week, trying to stay ahead of all of you, so that when I come, I have something new to bring, because I love doing that. I love going back into the Word of God over and over again, because I always find things that I, I didn't see there before. And, and so part of it, what we were here saying today was thinking about this. I want you to all to understand, this is God-inspired. This is a prophecy coming from God. And I use this last word, report, report, because as we're going to see later, that is exactly what John was told to do by the Lord Jesus. He was told, I want you to write a report. And so think about it this way. If you were John and you're living in his day and you're seeing all these things, and I'm sure a lot of these things appeared to look strange, right, and unusual, well, what would you do? You would do your best to try to explain what you're seeing. I see a sword coming out of his mouth. Is that what John saw? Yes, that's what John saw. And of course, then we can think about what, what might that possibly imply? Uh, did John see the Lord's eyes like a flame of fire? Well, yes, when he looked, that's how he appeared. He appeared to glow like the sun in its full strength. And you'll notice he refers to his head glowing, his eyes glowing, his feet glowing. What do you get? He's glowing from head to foot. That's another way of saying it. So when he sees Jesus, he's glowing with the glory of God. There you go. All right, now, page four. Is it page four? Yes, page four. Now, I apologize up front because from time to time I will be introducing strange sounding words. But sometimes strange sounding words are important to learn because it teaches us about things that people have believed or still believe over the centuries. And that is particularly, okay, we know in chapter one he has a vision of Christ. If people accept the word of God as God inspired. There's not a lot of folk arguing, at least within evangelical conservative circles. There's, yeah, okay, I got that. And when we get to the seven churches, pretty much as, yeah, we, that, those are the seven churches. Now there's some ideas ex extend beyond that, and I'll get to that later. But it's when we get to chapter four, and we go to begin to look at the things that take place after these things, where this whole issue comes up of, okay, now when we say the future, we have to be fair here. We have to say it's in the future from the standpoint of John. And I'll show you why this becomes somewhat of an issue. But there's a word, it's called preterism. You see it? Preterism represents a somewhat broad field of interpretation which maintains 
and here's the key, much, most, if not all, of what is communicated in the book of Revelation occurred in the events of the first century. There is a very famous person that many of you may have known who went home to be with the Lord in the recent years. His name is R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul was a preterist. R.C. Sproul believed that much of these latter chapters in Revelation occurred and took place in the first century. That's a very, that's a, a, um, a position, not always, but sometimes is found in more reformed circles. If you understand what I mean by that, if you don't, then don't worry about that. But it is for some this idea that they would then find an interpretation of chapters 4 through 22 somehow took place. Now, the thing of it is, there's another view called historicism, which extends the application of Revelation across history, where history itself is debated. I'll give you an example. Never crossed my mind before, I wasn't taught this, but I eventually heard it one day in a class, that when you come to the seven churches, some have suggested that the seven churches characterize human history. That the first church, the characteristics of the first church, characterized the church in the early first century. And then after that, and then eventually you get to what they call the missionary church. And, and then the thing about the viewpoint is, is that we end up today being the Philadelphia church. Um, and it's kind of, it's a little funny, but not to make fun, but no one wants to be the Laodicean church, <laughs> which is the last church. So that's an example of historicism that says we're trying to find meaning in all of these chapters throughout all of, of human history. You, are you catching this? So some come to Revelation and say, it all happened in the first century. Others come to Revelation and say, we're going to find where it has already taken place. And maybe some things, maybe when we get to chapter 19, when Christ comes back, maybe that's still out there. And that's why there are people that are called hard preterists and soft preterists. A hard preterist is someone who tries to say, it has all taken place all the way through chapter 22, whereas on the other hand, the soft preterist says, well, a lot of it's taken place, but not all of it yet. And that was more where R.C. Sproul was at in his position. But meanwhile, there's another position called the prophetic futurism. Prophetic futurism. And that is that what we have in chapters 4 through 22 are events that have not yet been fulfilled but still lie out in the future. Okay? You see that difference? So in other words, when Daniel had his visions, those prophecies were out in the future. Many of them were fulfilled. But there are actually still parts of Daniel that have still not been fulfilled. Like the last seven week, the last week of seven, which is really seven years. It still lies out there. So I want to let you know, because I'm not going to read all of that particular page four, that that's where I'm at. When I come to the book of Revelation, I think that chapters 4 through 22 still lie out in the future, known to God. When that will be, and, I, and as we begin to dig into the book, I hope to prove and make a case 
for why I believe that way. In page five, as we dream when we're asleep, and a dream is when we're asleep, a vision is something that is experienced when you're awake. John says, he reports that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, chapter one, verse 10. Now the Lord's day at that time was now understood as what? As Sunday, because they were now associating it with the resurrection. And he receives a spirit derived vision. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul has a similar experience. And I quote this for you. In 2 Corinthians 12, he says, and Paul was actually talking about himself, boasting is necessary, though it's not profitable. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, and he's actually talking about himself, whether in the body, I don't know, or out of the body, I don't know. Now, this is great because what he's saying is, when I had this vision, I can't honestly tell you, was I really there? But all I can tell you is, it was like I was really there. Are you with me? So when John gets caught up into heaven and he reports the vision, he's saying, it sure seemed like I was really there. And perhaps he really was. But whether in the body I don't know or out of the body I don't know, but God knows that such a man was caught up into the third heaven. It's an important phrase, third heaven, because it's referring to what, do you know? God's heaven, God's heaven. And I know how, and I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, God knows was caught up into paradise and I heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Now John, actually in Revelation at one point, he even hears, I think it's the seven peals of thunder. He hears something and he's about to write it. And it's the one time he's told, don't write what you just heard. You're not allowed to. And here Paul himself is saying, I, I heard things, things that go beyond our, our natural realm, but things that a man is not even permitted to speak. Therefore, John is caught up in some physical or spiritual sense into heaven, in the spirit, an event that even the apostle Paul couldn't explain, but it was very, very real. It was real. And what might also be observed is how preterists, not all, interpret the beginning chapters. Um, most, as I said, soft preterists have to admit by the time they get to the tail end of the book, it has to be out in the future. You know, it's really hard to find a place in the first century, an event where Christ came back with the armies of heaven and established his kingdom on earth. Like, you're not going to find it. And the only way you can do that is to make it all into a great big symbol. Because otherwise, but, you know, but that, de that defeats the whole purpose here. And so I do take a futurist position, and, and that's how I'm going to be presenting the book of Revelation in the weeks to come. And I sure hope you come back. I sure hope you come back. And I love having you all here. Like I said, this is my own original work. I'm do my best to try to stay ahead of all of you. And if you have any other friends or whatever that want to join us, there's still plenty of time for them to, to jump in and join us. And if you miss a week, um, I am recording these. And so that'll be another way of also catching up. Father, I thank you, Lord, for our time together. I feel blessed already, Father. Blessed by your word, blessed by the book of Revelation, blessed by this grand vision of Christ all of his glory. We worship you, Lord. And Father God, that we would draw even closer to you. We pray all these things now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen? amen. And amen. I think I'm beginning to 
finally feel okay I met someone named Jesus just, well, just the other day